members of Desert View Bible Church. I'm Mike Bodine, one of the shepherds here at Desert View. Um, this is a, a, a great study that we're in here in the book of Acts. And today we are going to be looking uh, in uh, Acts chapter 3. And so join me in prayer, will you? Lord, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to bring your word and, and uh, uh, your Holy Spirit to uh, these men. And uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would have your way. Lord, that uh, the hearers would uh, be blessed, Lord. And that, um, God, you will be honored and glorified through all that is said and done here today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, we pray, amen. Well, again, brothers, it's uh, good to be here with you. And um, uh, I'm kind of excited about this particular study in Acts chapter 3. Uh, it brings some of uh, actual experience uh, in the matter of our topic there. And so let's just go ahead and get started. And I'm going to get, we're going to start with a story. And it's a true story. And it was in uh, late winter in 1982. It was just at weeks after I came to know the Lord, after I uh, asked Jesus to come into my life. A two foot snowstorm had dumped that previous night. And uh, I remember getting up that morning, coming out of my house. And as the sun was now shining, I was seeing uh, snow on these pine needles on this uh, pine tree in my house. And ice crystals were forming on it. And I just looked at it in awe and, and amazement. And then I looked over at Donner Lake, which was right across the street from uh, my house there. And the sun was shimmering on the lake. And it was amazing. I had never seen splendor like that in the six years that I had lived there in Truckee. It was like I was viewing our Sierra Nevada creation with new eye lenses there, spiritual eyes. Anyway, so that morning I'm uh, driving into town and with Donner Pass Road is the main road there. I'm heading east to head into Truckee. As I do, I go in to get the mail and as I'm, dr as I'm driving, I. Uh, I'm looking up ahead and I notice um, this house that I rent for uh, some clients of mine that there were the three guys th that um, that uh, were renting that house uh, they were out in front and they had snow shovels and a little background on them is um, I did not like these punks uh, I had rented the house they were always late on their rent uh, whenever I would go up there to collect the rent, uh, beer, uh, beer bottles and cans and trash was out in front of the house. Uh, and it was mutual. They didn't like me either. So it wasn't a really uh, good fit to begin with there. They were, uh, they were ski bums, which just meant that they worked at a local resort and they got to, uh, for cheap pay and free skiing. Um, they, they worked there. Uh, so anyway, the history wasn't really good. There was, you might say, there was no love lost. But on this day, as I'm driving to the house, these guys are out with these shovels and they're standing around like a 70s VW square back. Um, and uh, they're, they're trying to dig out and I could, I could see it. And uh, it, was, it was interesting because Something inside me just said, you know, pull over. It wasn't, wasn't any audible voice there. Um, so I pull over to the right-hand side of the road, and fortunately the snow plows had been by, which created a place for me to do that. And I go walking across the street, and they're there with their shovels. They're actually standing around now. So I just came up to them, and I said, hey, uh, can, I, can I give you a hand? And they said, well... Uh, we're, we're stuck here. And the car had slid off the uh, side of the driveway, and so we're calling a, a tow truck. And so um, I went over there and I said, well, let's, let's just move it back onto the blacktop there. Crickets. They didn't say anything. And they were just, they continued just to stand there. So 
I went to the back of the car and uh, I, just, I, I just reached down and I lifted up the car. And then I shovel stepped two feet to my left and then I put the car back down. And so uh, I, said, I said something like, well, that should take care of it there. Just dig out, you know, from behind the car and you'll be good to go. So um, I don't recall that they actually said anything. I don't even recall what, they, what their reaction was. Uh, but I got back into my car and I continued to go into the post office there. I get into the post office. I'm walking over to box 386. I put the key in. I turn it to the right. And my hand is like stops. And all of a sudden it hits me. I lifted this car and I moved this car in two feet of snow and I just started laughing. I started laughing hysterically and people are, people are like looking at me like, you know, Bodine, what's up with you, you know? It was a small town and, and I couldn't believe it. Um, all I can say to this day is it was a miracle. Um, it was actually one of two miracles I experienced that day, but I'll talk about the other one shortly. But this is a segue to uh, lesson four, Acts chapter three in our life change study on the book called, and the title was Miracle. So some, first of all, some background. The day of Pentecost had happened. The Holy Spirit, via what sounded like a mighty rushing wind uh, and tongues or flames of fire, had rested on 120 disciples who began speaking in other languages, 17 actually. And um, uh, the crowd, a multitude of people in Jerusalem that day, they heard this humongous sound there. And so they actually came running there to find out what this commotion was all about. So this gives Peter an opportunity to deliver his first sermon to these crowd of, of Jews. And it had a miraculous impact with over 3,000 people um, that came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, repented of their sins, uh, of sending the Messiah to the cross. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. They received the gift and the filling of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of their sin. And just like that, the church added 3,000 new souls that day to the kingdom. That day, church life began with everyone having fellowship, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Uh, they had all things in common, even selling their possessions and distributing to those in need. And day by day, the Lord was adding to their number. A church life. There's something really special about a fellowship of believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit that meet together, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week, praying with one another, praying for one another, providing for and encouraging each others, especially those in need there. It's not corporate or commercial. A church life is, is alive. It's organic. It's Jesus ministering from the right hand of the throne of God through the power of the Holy Spirit to his body, the church, to bring in the kingdom of God. It's not about going to church. It's about being the church. Verse 243 stated that awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were happening through the apostles. But this miracle documented in chapter three was the first that the writer Luke elaborated on. That was probably for him to uh, tee up what was gonna happen in chapter four. So I'm gonna read right now, uh, chapter three, verses one to 11. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they daily laid at the gate of the temple that's called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. 
Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's there. Okay. So, post-Pentecost, Peter and John are heading up to the temple, the ninth hour of prayer, which for us would be like 3 o'clock. Uh, it's a regular time of prayer for the Jews. So at the same time, a lame man, uh, lame from birth, he is being carried into the same area from friends or family members and set down. We learn in chapter 4 that this man was over 40 years old. This man had no hope. Forty plus years lame, he had two choices. He could beg or die. Luke notes in his precise reporting that the lame man was daily set down at the gate called Beautiful. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, this gate was ornately beautiful. There's also some question as to whether or not the lame man was actually allowed beyond a certain point of the temple because of his infirmed condition. The lame man's purpose was not to pray, but was to beg for arms. He, he wanted money, he needed money. It was actually an acceptable practice for the lame uh, in Judaism to beg for alms. Um, I recall in the early 2000s, 30 of us from our church, we went to uh, Ghana, Africa. I remember getting off the plane um, at the airport there. And uh, as we were leaving the, the uh, tarmac area, there was a line of wheelchairs and crippled people who were begging alms there. Right at this time, this man sees Peter and John and asks to receive alms. Instead, Peter and John fix their gaze at him and said, look at us. And the guy does just that, thinking that this is his lucky day, payday. Instead, Peter says, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, in this story, I typically think of myself as being either John or, or Peter, uh, being in their shoes and kind of wishing that I had that sort of a faith to be as bold as those guys were. In reality, we were, and perhaps some of us might now be, that lame man. Spiritually dead, without hope that anything will change in life. Fellas, do you know of, uh, of someone who's going through a difficult season of life? Perhaps a friend, family member, or coworker who hasn't met Jesus yet? Could the Holy Spirit be nudging you to be that disciple that can extend your hand or to help carry and lift that person up? Or are you the one that needs that? Brothers, what do we have to give one another? We may think that we've got nothing to give, but if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit living in you. But the enemy wants you to think that you've got nothing for them. Bodine, you got nothing. Sit down and shut up. I've, I've heard that on more than one occasion. Or if you're not a believer, the enemy may be saying to you, you're good, you're fine. You go to work, you go to a, a church uh, twice a month. You don't need to do anything. At that moment, 
Peter is supernaturally infused with the gift of faith. And he seizes the man and he pulls him up. See 1 Corinthians 12, 9. And he's walking. This formerly lame man immediately becomes a boisterous and thankful, leaping dance worshiper of God. Twice it's noted that this man was praising God. And maybe for the first time now, he's going to be entering the temple. Well, this commotion begins to draw a crowd. All the people know exactly who this guy is. And now he's walking, leaping, and praising God. And the crowd is filled with wonder and amazement. The word amazement means a displacement of the mind, bewilderment, astonishment, trance. In other words, these, onla these onlookers, they had no mental slot of the miraculous healing that they were now witnessing there. Acts 3, 12 to 15. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Well, Peter knew an opportunity when he saw it and by the leading of the Spirit, he took it. In these verses, Peter, as leader and spokesperson of the church, seeks to set the record straight that this healing was not from he or John, but from Israel's God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of their fathers, who through this miracle glorified God's servant Jesus. In verses 13 to 15, Peter now delivers five blows to the Jews for the knockout. He said, you delivered Jesus over to be killed. You denied him in the presence of Pilate, who, by the way, was going to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one. You asked for a scumbag murderer to be released to you instead. And now the knockout blow. You killed the author of life. Oh, and incidentally, the guy you murdered, he's alive. Our God raised him him from the dead, of which we are witnesses. In verse 316, Peter states how this miracle came about. And by his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter declares that the healing was done in Jesus' name, the matchless name of Jesus, and by faith that is through Jesus has healed this man. Oh, brothers, that we would be so clear um, that all we have, all that we are, and all that we will be in Christ is by God's grace, not our own godliness, holiness, self-effort, for we have nothing apart from the Spirit of Jesus living in us and working through us. See Galatians 2.20. This should be so encouraging to us. You don't have the faith? I don't either. But Jesus does. Faith that is not through the name of Mike, but the faith that is in the name of Jesus. So we call on the name of Jesus, who has been given all authority in heaven and earth, and now as his proxy given to his church, we trust in the name of Jesus. We pray earnestly in the name and the authority of Jesus himself that we or a loved one would be healed, would be saved. When the Lord doesn't heal, we appeal. Shamelessly, we can continue to appeal to heaven. Do we pray for miraculous healings and interventions in our lives? Yes. Do we pray for miraculous conversions of family members who, through all the years, were so turned off by our faith? Absolutely. Now, Pastor Shepherd Peter softens his tone. 
In verse 17 through 21, he says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he had thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. In these verses, Peter exhorts the crowd that although they and their rulers acted ignorantly in putting the Lord to death, they were still culpable. But Peter, with much grace, and remembering that just, just weeks before, he too had denied his Lord, could now offer them the gift of repentance, which he had received, resulting in forgiveness of sin. And the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This word presence literally means face uh, or countenance. Verse 19 shows that repentance and turning back are both required for salvation. Repentance means to change our mind, turn from sin. Turning back is to turn toward God. We do an about face, a 180 from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and now focus our lives on following Jesus only. Turning from sin and toward the Lord should be a daily practice, brothers. Jesus, speaking to his church at Laodicea, says in uh, Revelation 3.19, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So let's finish up the text, verses 22 to 26. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And, that sh and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Peter's message to them should not have been unexpected, as the message of all the prophets from Moses onwards foretold the, the time of the Messiah's suffering. Moses told the people that the Lord would send a prophet who, who would become who is Jesus, like himself, that they and their offspring would need to listen to. And if they didn't, they would be destroyed from among the people, indicating that the, lis the listening and doing would be a judgment on the individual. And the result? Whether it's a day of salvation or a day where we've fallen short, our sins are blotted out. And times of refreshing will come to us from the presence, the face of the Lord. And then Peter reminds them of their roots and God's covenant promise to Abraham and their fathers that in Abraham's offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And we are partakers of that promise. Once in a while, it hits me. I'm a Christian. I have Christ. Christ living in me. I am part of an eternal kingdom that will never end. Now, ch chapter 3 may bring up discussion in your groups about miracles. Are miracles, signs and wonders, still happening today? If you believe they are, you would be considered a continuationist. And if not, you'd be considered a cessationist. Fancy words. In one sense, I'm thankful that signs and wonders are not a black and white doctrinal issue. And it's certainly not an issue about our salvation.
But you might expect that the experience that I had over 40 years ago would convince me that yes, miracles happen today. And that is my personal belief. But then how do you define a miracle? I mentioned at the beginning of our study that there were two miracles that happened that late winter day in 1982 in Truckee. You see, lifting a 3,000 pound car was child's play compared to the miracle of God changing a man's heart. That day when I saw those guys stuck in the snow, from that moment, another person, the Holy Spirit, took over and moved me to pull over and do the deed. But all the while in me, there was no anger, no resentment, but instead a genuine kindness and peace that I had never before experienced when dealing with these guys and many others. Was it love? I'm not sure. I didn't share Jesus with them. I didn't even say, God bless you. I mean, I'm a new Christian. But from that day on, my animosity towards them was gone. I was spiritually seeing these guys in a different light. No miracle can compare with the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Signs and wonders, we can debate and banter about whether or not the miraculous, the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit are happening today. I believe the Lord manifests his presence and power, however, and whenever he wants for his purpose, for his glory, he will do it. But in this, I'm charismatic. I want to receive from the Holy Spirit everything that he has for me, brothers. If that includes the miraculous, amen. If that's speaking in an angelic language, praise the Lord. But more than anything else, I want to moment by moment walk in the Spirit, continuously being filled in spirit, being led by the spirit. So I yield and surrender all to him all the time as best I can. And as much as I'm aware, I have given the Holy Spirit the complete reins of my life. Brothers, I'm in the last quarter of life. Heck, maybe it's overtime or even sudden death. But whatever it is, I want to be found by Christ, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that is through faith in Christ. I want to walk my talk. And on that day, I believe I will hear him say, well done, my son, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. As a bond, as a bond slave of the Lord Jesus, We'll see the miraculous every day, and much of it will be in how the Lord is growing us. The highly acclaimed and esteemed international author and theologian, Dr. Wayne Grudem, who's a part of Scottsdale Bible, was asked how important is this issue of the miraculous in the grand scope of all that's going on in the church today. He, he had this to say. I would want to say to cessationists, and to open but cautious people, on the one hand, that I agree that there are ways in which the Holy Spirit is still working that are similar to what was happening in the first century churches and described in the New Testament. I think that the first century church and the New Testament generally encourages us to seek miraculous workings of the Holy Spirit much more than we do in mainstream evangelical churches. I think if we did, and if we taught about spiritual gifts that were consistent with Scripture and which put safeguards against abuses, that we would see a much greater explosion of the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in bringing more unbelievers to Christ and in bringing physical and emotional and relational healing to people within our churches and in bringing us to new levels of joy and worship beyond the very positive things that we see today. I would like to see much more. 
not just openness to, but encouragement of the miraculous works of the Holy Spirit. One last story, another true story. I, I will close with this. My in-laws, Dexter and Kay Donison, Karen's folks, were living in Sun City. This is about 20 years ago now. Mom loves the Lord. My father-in-law, Dexter, uh, he's a type 1 diabetic and, and is, in Karen's words, my own too, uh, uh, a little rough around the edges. But he was a loving and sweet dad to his kids there. He loved working on cars. He had a passion for them. Uh, he was a lineman, lineman with uh, Pac Bell in Northern California. Um, he, he really had to retire s uh, shorter than he probably would have. He was, he was losing his eyesight there. Dexter loved NASCAR, and he was no stranger to colorful language. He watched TV all throughout the day. At, time Dex, at times, Dexter would go to church with his family on special occasions, holidays, etc. And he even became a, a deacon with uh, a Lutheran church that they attended in the, in the uh, younger days of the kids. He was not a believer, but mom was a prayer. And she always prayed for Dex and all four of her kids' salvation. So, 20 years ago, Dad had developed a pain in his back. He saw doctors, and uh, a back surgery for a bone chip was planned for him in Sun City West. While he was in the hospital, a local couple, Al and Arlene, who had a ministry of visiting the sick of lo at local hospitals, they had visited Dex. They asked him if they could pray for him, for anything. And Dex explained that he was waiting back surgery, so this couple prayed for Dad's surgery and its success. Now, at this time, you might be thinking, well, then, if this is a miracle, then probably when they went to do the surgery there, that there was no, there was actually nothing there and, um, at all, and, and he's good, and it would turn out he'd be healed and he would have no more pain, but that's not how this story goes here. He has the surgery, and a few days later after that surgery, he's recuperating, but he's complaining about pain. In fact, the pain was getting worse, and no amount of narcotics could ease the pain. The sad thing is, in one way, is that a biopsy actually had been done a week before, but that hospital did not read the biopsy. It was right at that time and it was a Sunday afternoon. I'll never forget it. And mom, my mother-in-law, will never forget it as well as Karen. That day, uh, mom is in with dad in the hospital room. And he tells her that he had become a Christian. Now, Dex had told mom in the past that he was a Christian. So mom, this time, asked asked him, what do you mean by that? And he told her that God was missing in his life. And he now believed that Jesus was the only way to heaven and that he needed to have his sins forgiven. Shortly after this conversation, Karen and I arrive in the room for a typical visit. We see that the dad, Dexter, and, and mom's eyes are, are tearing up and Dex seemed to be in some distress. So we looked at Dex and then we looked at mom and mom says, your dad has something to say to you. And he tells us the same thing, that he's become a Christian. And we're, we're like shocked. We did not see that one coming. Now, Dex had heard the gospel hundreds of times in the past, and he never had a response. No one led him in the sinner's prayer. Although he mentioned that this couple, Al and Arlene, who visited him in his room and prayed for his surgery, impacted him. For the next few days, Dad told people 
the medical staff and the family that he was now a Christian. He was unabashedly telling them. He was telling the medical staff that he was sorry for how gruff that he had been to them. Dad was born again. Dad was transformed. He was a new creation. It, was, it happened right in front of our eyes. He was a miracle. In the following days, his daughter Patricia brought him Bible teaching cassette tapes, which he listened to, foregoing his former obsession with TV. But Dad's story is not over. His pain, as we would all learn the next day from the previously unread biopsy, was not because of his back, it was from cancer. very aggressive cancer that the doctors could not isolate the source of because it had spread so much throughout his body. Within a week or so, Dad entered hospice, where he passed away shortly to spend eternity with a perfectly restored body in God's presence, seeing Jesus face to face. So, lifting a 3,000 pound car versus Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to Dexter Donison. What say you brothers? Are miracles for today? God bless you.